Hi folks, this is Jay, and I uh, hope you're okay today. Um, we're looking at the New Testament canon, and uh, and we're looking at F.F. Bruce, and he writes, even when we have come to a conclusion about the date and origin of the individual books of the New Testament, another question remains to be answered: How did the New Testament itself, as a collection of writing, come into being? Who collected the writings, and on what principles? What circumstances led to the fixing of a list or a canon of authoritative books? The historic Christian belief is that the Holy Spirit in control the writing of the individual books, also controlled the selection and collection to continue to fulfill our Lord's promise that he would guide his disciples into all truth. This, however, is something that is to be discerned by spiritual insight and not by historical research. Our object is to find out what historical research reveals about the origin of the New Testament can canon. Some will tell us that we receive the 27 books of the New Testament on the authority of the Church, but if we do, how did the Church come to recognize these 70, 27, and no others as worthy of being placed on a level of inspiration and authority of the, of the Old Testament canon? The matter is oversimplified in Article 6 of the 1939 Articles. When it says, in the name of the Holy Scriptures, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament, of whose authority was never in any doubt in the Church. Leaving on one side the question of the Old Testament canon, it is not quite accurate to say that there has never been any doubt in the Church of any of the Testament books. A few of the shorter epistles, e.g. 2 Peter 2 and 3 John, James and Jude, and the revelation were much longer in being accepted in some parts than in others, while elsewhere books which we do not now include in the New Testament were received as canonical, thus the Codex Sinaiticus included the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas, a Roman work of about 110 or earlier, while the Codex Alexandrius included the writing known as the First and Second Epistle of Clement, and the inclusion of these works alongside the biblical writings probably indicates that they were accorded some degree of canonical status. The earliest list of New Testament books of which we have def definite knowledge was drawn up at Rome by the heretic, heretic Marcion about 140 AD. Marcion distinguished the interior creator God, inferior creator God of the Old Testament from the God and Father revealed in Christ. I believe that the church ought to jettison all the appertained to the former. This theological anti-Semitism involved rejecting not only the entire Old Testament, but also those parts of the New Testament which seemed to him to be infected with Judaism. So Marcion's canon consisted of two parts, an expurgated edition of the third gospel, which is the least Jewish of the gospels, being written by the Gentile Luke, and ten of Paul's epistles, the three pastoral epistles being omitted. Marcion list, however, does not represent the current verdict of the church but a deliberate abbreviation from it. Another early list of Roman uh, province dated about the end of the second century is that commonly called the Moratorium Fragment because it was first published in Italy in 1740 by the antiquarian Cardinal L. A. Moratori. It is unfortunately mutilated at the beginning but it evidently mentioned Matthew and Mark because it refers to Luke as the third gospel then it mentions John, Acts, Paul, nine letters to churches and four to individuals, Philemon, Titus, two Timothy, Jude, two epistles of John and Apocalypse of John, and that of Peter. The Shepherd of Hermes is mentioned as worthy to be read, i.e. church, but not to be included in the number of prophetic or apostolic writings. The first steps of the formation of a canon of authority of Christian books worthy to stand beside the Old Testament canon, which was the Bible of our Lord and his apostles, appear to have been taken about the beginning of the second century, when there is evidence for the circulation of two collections of Christian writings in the church. At the very early date, it appears that the four Gospels were united in one collection. They must have been brought together very soon after the writing of the Gospel according to John. This full full collection was known originally as the gospel in the singular, not the gospels in the plural. There was, there was only one gospel narrated in, of course, distinguishes according to Matthew, according to Mark, and so on. 
About 115, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, refers to the Gospel as an authoritative writing, and as he knew more than one of the four Gospels, it may well be that the Gospel he means the four collection which went by the name. About 170, an Assyrian Christian named Tatian turned the four Gospels into a continuous narrative of harmony of the Gospels, which for long was the favourite, if not the official form of the four Gospels in the Assyrian Church. It was distinct from the four Gospels in the Old Syriac version. It is not certain whether Tatian originally composed his harmony, usually known as the Diatessaron in Greek or in Syriac, but as it seems to have been compiled at Rome, its original language was probably Greek, and a fragment of Tatian's Diatessaron in Greek was discovered in the year 933 at Durer-Upus on the Euphrates. At any rate, it was given to the Assyrian Christian Christians in a Syriac form when Tatian returned home from Rome, and this Syriac diatessaron remained the authorised version of the Gospels for them until it was replaced by the Peshita or simple version in the 5th century. By the time of Irenaeus, who though a native of Asia Minor was a bishop of Lyons in Gaul about AD 180, the idea of a four full Gospel had become so axiomatic in the church at large that he can refer to it as an established and recognized facts as obvious as the four cardinal points of the compass or the four winds. Irenaeus writes, For as there are four quarters of the world in which we live, and four universal winds, and as the church is dispersed over all the earth, and the gospel is the pillar and the base of the church and the breath of life, so it's natural that it should have four pillars breathing immortality from every quarter and kindling the life of men anew, whence it is manifest that the word, the architect, of all things who sits upon him and holds all things together having been manifested to men has given us the gospel in a fourfold form but held together by one spirit when the four gospels were gathered together in one volume it meant the serve the severance of the two parts of luke's history when, sorry about this hello yeah hiya barry okay barry yeah, I'm okay, thanks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't worry about it, yeah. All right, Barry, don't worry about it. <laughs> I hope it gets sorted out for you, mate. Are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming down on Saturday? Once. All right, it'd be good to see you anyway. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, mate. Good to see you anyway, bro. All right. See you now. Take it. What's up, bro? No, no, no. Not today, mate. No. <laughs> All right, bro. Nice day anyway, mate. Take care now. Bye. Bye. Sorry about that, folks. Someone wanted me to visit on Sunday.
we've just had to cancel it because the car's not too good. Okay, um, let's finish off with um, FF Bruce. When the four Gospels were gathered together in one volume, it meant the severance of the two parts of Luke history. When Luke and Acts were thus separated, one or two modifications were apparently introduced into the text at the end of Luke and at the beginning of Acts. Originally, Luke seems to have left all mention of the extension to his second treatise. Now the words and was carried up into heaven were added in Luke 14.51 to round off the narrative. And in consequence was taken up was added in Acts 1.2. Thus the inconsistencies with some have detected between the accounts of the extension in Luke and Acts are most likely due to these adjustments made when the two books were separated from each other. Acts however naturally shared the authority and prestige of the third gospel being the work of the same author and was apparently received as gospel with the epistles and by its record of the conversion call the missionary service of Paul showed clearly how real an apostolic authority lay behind the Pauline epistles. The Corpus Paulinium or collection of Paul's writing was brought together about the same time as the collection of the fourfold gospel as the gospel collected was designated by the Greek word evangelion euangelion so the Pauline collection was designated by the word apostolos each letter being distinguished as to the Romans, first to the Corinthians, and so on. Before long, the anonymous epistle to the Hebrew was bound up with the Pauline writings. Acts, as a matter of convenience, came to be bound up with the general epistles, those Peter, James, John, and Jude. The only books about which there are any substantial doubt after the middle of the second century were some of those which came at the end or new of the New Testament. Origin in 185 to 254 mentions the four Gospels, Acts 13, Epistles 1 Peter. Five to three, four dimensions as generally acknowledged all groups of the New Testament except James, Jude, two Peter, and three John. Um, so, Eusebius two six five three four dimensions as generally acknowledged all the groups of our New Testament except James, Jude, two Peter, three John, which were disputed by some but recognized by the majority. Athanasius in 367 lays down 27 books of our New Testament as a, as a, a long canonical, short, short, canonical. Shortly afterwards, Jerome and Augustine followed the example in the West. The process further east took a little longer. It was not until 508 that 2 Peter 2 and 3 John, Jude and Revelation, were included in a version of the Syriac Bible in addition to the other 22 books. For various reasons, it was necessary for the church to know exactly what books were divinely authority. The Gospels, recording all that Jesus began to both, and to both to do and to teach, could not be regarded as one whit lower in authority than the Old Testament books. And the teaching of the apostles in the Acts and epistles were regarded as vested with his authority. It was natural then to accord to the apostolic writings of the New Covenant the same degree of homage as was already paid to the prophetic writings of the Old. Thus, just in March, about 150, classes the memoirs of the apostles along with the writings of the prophets, saving that both were read in meetings of Christians. But the church did not, in spite of the breach with Judaism, repudiate the authority of the Old Testament, but following the example of Christ and his apostles, received it as the word of God. Indeed, so much did they make the Septuagint their own, that although it was originally a translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, for Greek-speaking Jews before the time of Christ, the Jews left the Septuagint to the Christians and a fresh Greek version of the Old Testament was made for Greek-speaking Jews. It was especially important to determine which books might be used for the establishment of Christian doctrine and which might most confidently be appealed to in disputes with heretics. In particular, when Martian drew up his canon about 140, it was necessary for the Orthodox churches to know exactly what the true canon was and this helped to speed up a process which had already begun. It is wrong, however, to talk or write as if the church first began to drop a canon after Martian had published his. Other circumstances which demanded clear definition of those books which possessed divine authority were the necessity of deciding which books should be read in church services, though certain books might be 
sustainable suitable for this purpose which could not be used to settle doctrinal questions and the necessity of knowing which books might and might not be handed over on demand to the imperial police in times of persecution without incurring the guilt of sacrilege one thing must be emphatically stated apostolic authority direct or indirect the first ecclesiastical councils to clarify canonical books were both held in North Africa at Hippos Regis in 393 and at Carthage in 397 but what these councils did was not to impose something new upon the Christian communities but to codify what was already the general practice of those communities there are many theological questions arising out of the history of the canon which we cannot go into here but for practical demonstration that the church made the right choice one need only compare the books of our New Testament with the various documents collected by M. R. James in his apocryphal New Testament or even with the writings of the Apostolic Fathers to realize the superiority of our New Testament books to these others a word may be added about the gospel according to Hebrews which is was mentioned above Origen listed as one of the books which in his day was disputed by some. This work, which circulated in Transjordan and in Egypt amongst the Jewish Christians called the Ebonites, bore some affinity to the canonical Gospel of Matthew. Perhaps it was an independent expansion of an Aramaic document related to our canonical Matthew. It was known to some of the early Christian fathers in the Greek version. Jerome in 347 to 420 identified this Gospel according to Hebrews with one which he found in Syria called the Gospel of the Nazarene and which he mistakenly thought at first was the Hebrew or Aramaic original of Matthew. It is possible that he was also mistaken in identifying it with the Gospel according to the Hebrews. The Nazarene Gospel found by Jerome and translated by him into Greek and Latin may simply have been an Aramaic translation of the canonical Greek Matthew. In any case, the Gospel according to the Hebrews and the Gospel of the Nazarenes both had some relation to Matthew, and they are to be distinguished from the multitude of apocryphal Gospels which also occur in those and which have no bearing on our present historical study. These, like several books of the Apocryphal Acts and similar writings, are also entirely pure romances. One of the books of the Apocryphal Acts, however, the Acts of Paul, while admittingly a romance of the second century, is interesting because of a pen portrait of Paul which it contains, and which, because of its vigorous and unconventional character, was thought by Sir William Ramsey to embody a tradition of the Apostles' appearance preserved in Asia Minor. Paul is described as a small man in size with meet, meeting eyebrows with a rather large nose, bald headed, bow legs, strongly built, full of grace. For a time he looked like a man, at times he had a face of an angel. So that's FF Bruce and we'll be doing more on the canon because it's something that I'm researching at the moment. Okay, there might be some more videos later on today as I'm just spending time reading today on the canon. Okay, take care and God bless.